Landon Lecturers on Public Issues, a series begun at Kansas State University this year, inaugurated by former Kansas Governor Alfred M. Landon himself, and due to attract the leading public figures in this country to KSU in the years to come. Next year, for instance, we expect Senator Robert Kennedy and Governors George Romney and Ronald Reagan. This program, however, is concerned with one of America's most distinguished journalists, Ralph McGill. Mr. McGill is a Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist and a publisher of one of the nation's greatest newspapers, the Atlanta Constitution. At Kansas State, Mr. McGill spoke on the emerging South, politics and issues. Ralph McGill. There is today in the beginnings of a two-party system in the South. The Republican Party as it exists presently in 1967 is neither a united nor a happy one. Its leadership is all too often those who have deserted the Democratic Party because of opposition to civil rights. Too much of the Republican effort in the South has been and is an attempt to win votes by adopting programs more racist or more conservatively racist than those of the Southern Democrats. It cannot be said that a single state Republican organization in the South has ever endorsed the national Republican platform plank on civil rights. In 1964, for example, Governor Wallace of Alabama gave aid and comfort to a number of Republican candidates for Congress and other local offices in Alabama. Republican election gains were significant insofar as the labels meant anything. Republicans won a great many victories in that state in 1964 and a fewer number in other southern states. But in 1966, just two years later, this same Governor Wallace, with his wife as the candidate, turned against the same man whom he had supported before because he wanted a slate of nominees who would be favorable to his wife's candidacy for the governor and to his later third party Southern Democratic movement. The Republicans of 1964, therefore, were destroyed in 1966. In 1966, there was a general falling off of Southern Republican successes as compared with those of 64. Senator Goldwater's political managers had determined on what they called a Southern strategy. This was in reality a poorly concealed racist strategy. It was based on the belief that Senator Goldwater could not win the Northern Negro vote. It was felt by his strategists that he might conceivably carry a few of the northern states, but they believed he could, by satisfying southern prejudices, gather in the whole block of southern electoral votes and perhaps win an electoral victory. In Georgia, for example, in 1964, the present governor, Mr. Lester Maddox, then engaged in an open running fight against public accommodation laws, uh, which at one time led him to be chasing persons around with a pistol, Cynic cynically declared that Senator Goldwater's racial position suited him, Mr. Maddox. In Alabama, Governor Wallace abandoned his own third party program so that he would not get in Senator Goldwater's way, also saying, he was satisfied with, this, uh, with the senator's position. This racist dilemma will continue to plague the Southern Republican development, but as I see it, while sad and regrettable, it is perhaps a necessary part of the trauma of developing a second party in a region where such a development was for so long impossible. Nor should the melodrama of race by the so-called Southern Republicans 
hide the fact that there are many reputable first-rate men and women who are at work trying to create a Southern Republican Party of responsibility and prestige. Some of these men had managed to make considerable progress until the takeover by the Goldwater forces in 1964. These Republicans are not, were not, and will not be racist nor men of prejudice in this area so important to the present and future of our country. These Republicans are men committed to what they believe to be the principles of a genuinely progressive conservatism. Most of them were replaced as state chairman and national committeemen by the Goldwater Organization takeover in 1964, but they are coming back. They have by no means given up, and they have not really lost the struggle to create a responsible, competing second party. The Southern Democrats awoke out of an old dream to find themselves also occupied with trauma and dilemma. The divisive effects of racism and the determination of rural leaders to maintain segregated school systems at no matter what the cost to educational standards in general have contributed to a substantial split in what used to be called the solid democratic South. We now know that in fact, we never really had a democratic party such in the South, such as existed in states outside that region. We too were lulled by the old myths. In the Southern one party states, the Democratic Party was what the governor made it. There were factions, each calling itself Democratic, and they contended for the governorship in the absence of an opposition party. But when it became necessary in 1964 and 66, for Southern Democrats to function as an organized party, they found themselves unable to do so because they had no effect, really efficient state or county organizations. They had never needed such organizations because there had been an absence of political opposition. They too found their own ranks split by racist divisions. Another thing is happening. There is an increasing disposition, especially on the part of younger voters, not necessarily to follow the party of their fathers, but to split their votes and to act more and more as independent voters rather than those with party affiliation. And for the present, at least, it seems to me that there is in our region, as well as others, a blurring of party lines. It cannot now be said that the Democratic Party in the South is well organized or that it will be so by the time the 1968 campaign arrives. Certainly racist influences, both direct and indirect, will plague and embarrass both parties in the next presidential campaign. I believe it necessary, therefore, that there be a general, a greater national comprehension of the political and social history of the South because the effects of that history now are in truth a national problem, both political, economic, social. Let me say further that it is not at all my purpose here to simply berate the South. It is my region. I was born in it. I lived and had my education and worked in it. And I have an affection for it. But nonetheless, it is necessary to know that the romanticized myth of the South has been and is 
a curse and often a burden to those who live there. And this myth still obscures reality. The creation, in my opinion, and I think this justified by the obvious facts of our time, the creation of a system of segregation was an evil, the effects of which were deep and widespread beyond the easy assumption that it merely separated the races in travel, in education, and in housing. It did, in fact, subject the Negro, and most of the Negroes were in the southern, southeastern United States. It separated him to a separation. It subjected him to a separation that made it impossible, literally impossible, for him to know anything of participation and citizenship and the responsibilities of it. Segregation gave to the white Southerner a false sense of position and a false set of values. In trying to pay for two school systems in a region where the per capita income was inadequate to finance one good school system, the Southerner has subjected all children to an education inferior to that provided children of this state or other regions. He also slowed the industrial development of his own region. He delayed the appearance of managerial skills and the accumulation of capital. And there also was the profound moral dilemma of always justifying and supporting an immoral system and situation. In our time now, we can see the evils and the handicaps of a people who were never allowed to vote, who were never allowed to attend a PTA meeting, who were never allowed to attend a community meeting to discuss whether to issue bonds for a new school building or a waterworks or a sewage system or any other community developments, a people who live totally outside the American experience of citizenship responsibility. Political maturity, of course, was impossible under such a system. It was really not possible for a second party to develop into the South until about 1958, when the United States Supreme Court ruled the white primary unconstitutional. Participation in the fraud, admitted cheating, and dishonesty of the disfranchisement proceedings, which began to be cranked up in about 1900, had the effect of what the late W.J. Cash called in the mind of the South, saying that a large majority of poor white persons were delivered, along with most all Negroes, into the political control of a minority of white voters. All of this chicanery had to be justified. Out of it came the doctrines of white supremacy, of Negro inferiority, and a system of segregation whose moral, political, social, and economic injustices, its follies and evils are just now being fully comprehended. What is not, I believe, unhappily fully comprehended is that the product of this evil of seg segregation, with all of its ramifications, deprive not merely a top-heavy majority of the nation's Negroes, but also hundreds of thousands of white children of experience in citizenship and progress in education. This, the result, the net result of this system, has now been exported to all the nation. It has been exported to Kansas City, to the cities of the West, the East, the Midwest, 
the Southwest, it has been in fact nationally distributed and by export. An immense migration out of the rural South and the Southwest began during the bull weevil period of 1920 to 1930. This was the period when Detroit attracted to its automobile plants and to its tire plants and its fabricating metal plants literally hundreds of thousands of poor white Southerners and Negro tenant farmers who had been forced, and sharecroppers who had been forced off by the destruction of cotton by the bull weevil. Our counties within, I've been in counties at that time, 100 miles from Atlanta, which in eight years lost seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 persons uh, by an out-migration from the devastated cotton farm. Not all of this, as I said, was Negro out migration, but most of it was. This migration was stepped up in the 1940s, the late 1930s and the 1840s by the war. I do not think that the average American comprehends what has happened. I regret I am ashamed of the fact that I was not aware of it at the time it was happening. But an example will do. San Francisco, the beautiful and historic city in California, always has had a cosmopolitan population. In 1940, a part of that cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan population was a total of about 5,000 Negroes. This was 1940. In 1941, we remember what happened at Pearl Harbor. It became necessary to retake the Pacific. To do this, we proceeded to build more than 60,000 aircraft, ships, thousands of ships, landing craft, weapons, and equipment of all kinds, war plants from San Diego to, from Seattle to San Diego, filled up with workers, semi-skilled and unskilled, most of them off of the farms of southern states from Oklahoma, Texas, and other agricultural states. In 1945, the 5,000 Negro population in San Francisco was a little more than 50,000. Americans can better understand the discontent and the spontaneity of slum violence in the larger cities today if we keep in mind this background, in the span of time between 1940 and 1963, about three and a half million Negroes left the South. The wartime shipyards, the aviation, and other plants were the magnets that accelerated this out-migration. It has continued, this migration, as farm machines replaced human beings and mules. An official estimate, for example, reveals that 114,000 poorly educated, some of them not at all educated, 114,000 Negroes left 11 counties in Mississippi in the recent decade of 1950 to 1960. The out movement has slowed for obvious reasons, but it continues. The condition of the farm population in the old cotton states will worsen in the years ahead. It is interesting to note, it was interesting to me, I went out to Watts, California at the time of the riots, that they had been receiving until those riots about 1,000 rural untrained Negroes used only to a rural environment, used only to farm labor, they had been receiving a thousand a month up to the time of the riots, who arrived with just what they had on, with almost no money, no skills, hands that were curved maybe to fit a tractor wheel or a hoe handle 
and not much else. There is perhaps a long hot summer ahead. It is indeed almost at hand. The tensions resulting from the exporting from farm to cities of millions of poor, unskilled, illiterate, and semi-literate persons across the last four decades, the huge increase in our national population to about 200 million, half of which is 25 years old or younger, plus the burdens of war have increased and added complexity to our lives. It is a part of the problem that our heavy increase in population corresponds roughly with the out, also corresponds with the out-migration from the south and rural areas in general. I think we must ask ourselves, as we become indignant about riots, and as we become properly indignant about the excesses of the black power advocates, and of Stokely Carmichael and the symbol which he is, uh, need we not ask ourselves also, what is the contribution of leaders in high positions in school districts, in state capitals, in state legislatures, in mayor's offices, who provide the material that enables Stokely Carmichael, as I've heard him do, to go out and quote from Governor Wallace, or quote from Governor Maddox, or quote from some school principal, or legislator, or superintendent, and use these words to say to these people, you see the white man as your enemy. The white man will never give you a fair deal. You will never be allowed a fair opportunity in, Amer in America. This is a lie. Uh, your only way out is to destroy this society, which treats you in this manner. Well, now, there are only few of the Carmichaels. There are only a few of the new left in America, which wants to destroy this country and this society. But I think that we need to know that they are there. Uh, it is, they too are somewhat fragmented, but there are some who are training urban guerrillas to fight police and other law enforcement representatives from cellars, alleyways, and hidden positions. There are others who plan protests, riots, and other related tactics. It seems to me that they can succeed only if America loses a sense of balance and acts out of anger and emotional impulses. It is admittedly difficult to put down impulsive reactions to those who burn or de degrade the nation's flag, who do lend aid and comfort to our enemies. But it is in my opinion this precisely this weakness in human nature that is relied upon by the extreme of the new left in this country. And this new left, I can tell you, looks on communists as being sort of old-fashioned squares who are out of date. They tolerate them, but uh, that's about all. And this, ex these extremists of our new left, although few in number, certainly can succeed only if they arouse in our cities massive social and political protests and riots and thereby create a swing to the extreme political right. Hence, we may be expected to continue to have irritations and provocations all aimed at upsetting our human, our balance individually and nationally. These provocateurs want to demoralize this society, and they will keep trying to prod us to abandon the basic strengths of our society to retaliate against them by methods outside our constitutional guarantees. But of course, if we begin to selectively 
uh, forget all about the First Amendment. Uh, we will pretty soon find ourselves forgetting it and forgetting it until it no longer has any meaning. This new left, uh, the extremists of it, include an estimated 150 to 200,000 persons. It too is fragmented, but it includes a, these few who will continue to agitate and try to provoke, provoke us out of our civili civilization and out of our form of government. It hopes to arouse us by irrational protests and demonstrations into some sort of impulsive, blind reaction that will contribute to the erosion of our own principles. At any rate, there are 38 million Americans whose critical conditions of poverty are undenied. These include hundreds of thousands of poor whites in Appalachia and rural areas as well as those in the great cities. The young Negro in the South is aware of the progress being made in his behalf, but he still finds himself in predominantly all Negro or still all Negro state colleges and schools, which he knows to be inferior. He knows that his educational opportunity is not nearly that of the average young white American. He is made aware of the injustice of the past and the slow pace of the present. This is why some of them will listen to persons like Stokely Carmichael. One can easily imagine the frustration, despair, and emotional tensions of a young Negro living in states governed by a George Wallace or a Lester Maddox, or others who hear daily commitments to rigid segregation and to an inferior position of citizenship for the Negro. What can his, this young Negro's reaction be living in such a situation? And what a burden is put upon him to maintain his own balance and his own view of this country. It should be obvious, I think, that we cannot afford to ignore this problem of technology, of agricultural revolution, of population growth, and of the move to an urban America. Jefferson believed that if the people could be helped to know and comprehend the facts, they would in the end act with common sense. We are in a period complex emotional, exacerbated by the war, by all of the overburden of city growth, suburbia, when our times are emotional, more difficult, when common sense, understanding, and patience, but most of all, I believe, understanding are required of us. You have heard an address by Ralph McGill, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist and publisher of the Atlanta Constitution. Mr. McGill spoke at Kansas State University as the second in the Alf M. Landon Lecturers on Public Issues. Each of these Landon lecturers will be heard on perspective. Next year, we anticipate Senator Robert Kennedy, Michigan Governor George Romney, and California Governor Ronald Reagan. This is Howard Hill for Perspective. Perspective has been a public affairs presentation of this station and was recorded on the campus of Kansas State University. Join us again next week for Perspective. This program was produced by Extension Radio and Television at Kansas State University. This is the K-State Radio Network.